Welcome to section 7 of the Parasites. This is our overview figure showing the parasites you need to know for step 1. In this lecture, we will be talking about the Plasmodium species, which you can see right here. Plasmodium vivax and ovale, Plasmodium falciparum, and Plasmodium malariae. This diagram shows an abbreviated form of the malaria life cycle. First, a mosquito injects sporozoites into the bloodstream, and then these sporozoites invade the hepatocytes of the liver. Once there, they will form schizonts. Now these schizonts can sit around for a while in the liver and become dormant. These are called hypnozoites. But this dormant form really only happens with Plasmodium vivax and ovale. And we will help you memorize this fact later. Right now, just know that every species, including vivax and ovale, will at some point rupture the hepatocytes, releasing merozoites. Those merozoites go into the bloodstream and then invade red blood cells. Once there, they will again form a schizont, which is the trophozoite ring form. And we'll show you a picture of what that looks like later in the lecture. Then the schizont, just as it did with the hepatocyte, will burst, and it will release more merozoites. When these red blood cells burst out these merozoites, the immune system is triggered and the patient will get fever and chills. These merozoites can then go and infect more red blood cells. Now having a basic understanding of the life cycle is helpful, but there are really only three items you need to commit to memory. The first fact is that hypnozoites, which we discussed here, are related to Plasmodium vivax and ovale. The second fact is that the liver and the red blood cells are infected at some point during the life cycle. Infection of the liver is called the exoerythrocytic cycle, and infection of the red blood cells is called the erythrocytic cycle. And the third fact is that different species burst at different intervals resulting in fever and chills. For example, it can be every two days, every three days, or be irregular, which means that fevers and chills can happen every two days, three days, or at irregular intervals. With this conceptual understanding, let's dive into the nitty gritty details of malaria, including everything you need to memorize. Our story takes place at a health fair. You can see that attendees come to this area of the health fair to get their moles checked out. This area is clearly labeled the mole area. Mole area stands for malaria, which is the infection from plasmodium species. Now currently our world is all a buzz about protein shakes. It's quite a thriving industry and there's no better place to push your protein brand than by having samples at a local health fair. So this protein represents protozoa, which is the group to which plasmodium species belong. Now other health related items are also being sold including hygiene things like Axe body spray. So here's a guy trying a sample of free Axe body spray. If you look closely, you can see that the can has a star on it with five points. Below that is the commercial label Axe. Putting the five pointed star and the Axe together, we get five Axe, which sounds like Vivax. So this will be our symbol for Plasmodium Vivax. Now look closely at his shirt. It's one of those sleeveless shirts you might find people wearing at the gym. This big opening makes the shape of an oval. This opening represents Plasmodium ovale. We even lined this oval opening in red to help it stand out. Now it's best to think of Plasmodium vivax and ovale together. That's why we have represented both here with this one guy. So let's talk more about the details of Plasmodium vivax and ovale. Now the health fair has hired a very enthusiastic group of Clorox cleaners. Clorox clean, that's what they use to clean everything. Now Clorox clean sounds like chloroquine, also pronounced chloroquine. Chloroquine is an excellent treatment for Plasmodium vivax and ovale. To help you remember this, we've shown this Clorox cleaner spraying Clorox near the man's oval opening as well as his 5 ax can. So you should be able to remember that chloroquine is used to treat Plasmodium vivax and ovale. Now this vivax and ovale man has brought to the health fair his Dalmatian dog. You can see this dog has a big spot shaped like a liver. This represents the liver, and the man in purple to the left is trying to hypnotize the dog as a way to demonstrate the power of hypnosis as part of one's mental health. It looks like it worked on the dog. It's definitely hypnotized. Anyways, hypnotized sounds like hypnozoites. Hypnozoites are the dormant form of plasmodium species which hide out in the liver. So the hypnotized liver spotted dog represents dormant hypnozoites in the liver. After all, the dog's mind is dormant right now while it's under the influence of the hypnotist. Now the Vivax and Ovalley guy had a second liver spotted Dalmatian dog. One of the Clorox cleaners tried cleaning this dog but the canine wouldn't have it. Look at him bark the guy down who's now seen on his bum scared with his Clorox bottle not safely in his grasp? Well, this idea represents an important limitation of chloroquine. For whatever reason, chloroquine cannot effectively kill any dormant hypnozoites within the liver. So patients with Plasmodium vivax and ovale infections, if given only chloroquine, months later the symptoms will return when the hypnozoites finally release merozoites into the bloodstream. So you need a different medication to kill these hypnozoites. So let's introduce the high school's prom queen. The health fair thought that by inviting the high school's prom queen, they'd get more high schoolers to show up. Well, this prom queen stands for primaquine. And primaquine is a medication that's actually able to reach the dormant hypnozoites in the liver, something that chloroquine obviously couldn't do. 
In fact, notice how this prom queen isn't receiving that same hostile barking that the Clorox cleaner received. She's petting both liver-spotted dogs without any difficulty. This represents the fact that primaquin is needed to kill liver hypnozoites in Plasmodium vivax and ovale. Now before we introduce Plasmodium falciparum and Plasmodium malariae, let's talk about symptoms that malaria is known to cause. Now look at this sweaty guy. He just decided to try out some gym equipment on display at the health fair, and now he's going to try one of those protein shakes. Anyways, he worked up quite a sweat doing this. And this sweat represents the sweating that patients with malaria often get. Looks like there's the gym equipment that the guy was just using. And if you look near the gym equipment, you can see those heat lamps. The sellers of the gym equipment thought it would be a good idea to increase the heat in this gym area so that everyone would sweat a ton and feel like they got a good workout. Anyways, these heat lamps represent fever, which malaria can cause. Now we can see this smaller fellow pushing himself really hard, lifting heavy weights. So heavy, in fact, that he's shaking just trying to lift them. This represents the shaking chills caused by malaria. Now just like we showed before, when these red blood cells burst releasing those merozoites, the immune system will react, giving the patient fever and chills. Now let's talk about another symptom. It turns out that the health fair was successful in attracting high school kids. I mean, look at these hooligans causing a ruckus. This boy just lifted up the shirt of his buddy and slapped him nice and hard over his side, the area where the spleen resides. I'm not sure why young boys like to hurt their friends so much. Anyways. This obnoxious behavior indicates that they're high school students, so inviting the prom queen actually worked out in the health fair's favor. Anyways, this spleen-shaped welt represents the spleen, as in splenomegaly, which malaria can cause. Now there's some balloons over here to attract attendees over to some other gym equipment. Unfortunately, this guy lifted more than he could handle, so he dropped the dumbbell, which actually caught a red balloon on its way down, popping it once it hit the ground. Now these red balloons represent red blood cells, and the popping and loss of some of these balloons represents anemia, which is common in malaria. After all, malaria infects red blood cells and then bursts them. So anemia is a logical consequence of a malarial infection. Next in our story is this massive guy right here. He's demonstrating some major roid rage. He's been juicing on black market steroids for some time now. And as you may know, chronic use of exogenous steroids causes testicular atrophy, which is exactly what happened to this man. To compensate, he stuffed his pants with an obviously false pair. False pair sounds like false parum, or falciparum, as in plasmodium falciparum. Notice how this false pear guy is just taking out some of his roid rage on some of these nearby balloons. You can see him smashing one of the three red balloons innocently floating here. This represents the fact that Plasmodium falciparum infects one-third of the patient's red blood cells. So one of the red balloons getting punched stands for one-third of the red blood cells are infected with Plasmodium falciparum infections. And as you can see, the balloon was punched into this vent here, clogging it. This represents the clogging of small vessels that occurs with falciparum infections. And it's this clogging of small vessels that makes malaria infections with the falciparum species especially dangerous. It can damage kidneys, the lungs, and the brain. And we'll help you remember each of these organs, starting with the kidneys. We've shown this roid-raging false pear guy knock over this table, holding all these kidney beans which are seen falling around on the ground. These kidney beans are a good source of protein, so the health fair placed these kidney beans here as samples for all the attendees. Anyways, these kidney beans falling to the ground represent kidney damage in falciparum infections. Next, you can see that another table of kidney beans has fallen and smashed this machine. This machine performs lung tests for attendees that come to the health fair. You can see one health fair attendee is actually getting a lung test right now. It's likely not to be an accurate test since the machine is getting destroyed. Anyways, this lung machine destruction represents lung damage with plasmodium falciparum infections. Lastly, here's a person getting a brain EEG exam and he's clearly startled by all the ruckus. I mean, look at all those brain waves going crazy. This represents brain damage with falciparum infections. This includes seizures and coma. Now those kidney beans don't taste very good alone, and this pregnant health fair attendee was trying to make the kidney beans edible by adding some sugar to them. And when you're pregnant, those sugar cravings can be pretty strong, so I don't blame her. Anyways, she approached the kidney bean table at the unfortunate moment that this false pear guy knocked it over. She's pretty bummed that her kidney bean snacks are now falling to the dirty ground. Look at her reach out with her hand, sad at the loss. Distracted by her despair, she accidentally spills a bunch of her sugar. Well, the sugar on the ground represents low sugar, or hypoglycemia, which can occur in severe falciparum infections. Now, this woman is pregnant because it's mainly pregnant individuals that are susceptible to hypoglycemia with falciparum infections. To help reduce the chaos, this enthusiastic Clorox cleaner is trying to soothe the false pear rager. This represents the fact that chloroquine can be used to treat plasmodium falciparum. However, when things get bad or dangerous enough that the brain, lungs, or kidney are in jeopardy, it's best to enlist medications tougher than chloroquine. So let's talk about those next. Now see all these artists here. They are engaging in mental health therapy through painting and art. And you can see they've got those artist hats and the paintings around here. Well, this represents artemisinins, as in the artemisinin drugs. For example, artesanate or artemether. 
and these artists are now attending to the damaged area that the rager caused. And they are picking up kidney beans, also checking on the seizing brain guy over at the EEG machine, and the guy next to the broken lung machine. So this all represents the fact that when plasmodium falciparum threatens the brain, lung, or kidneys, give artemisinins, for example, artesanate. Now notice how one of the artists was painting this queen here, and this queen has a nine on her crown. And queen with a nine stands for quinine, or quinine. And just like artemisinins, IV quinine, or quinine, can be used for life-threatening falciparum infections. That's why artemisinins and the quinine painting are so closely related in this story. So artemisinins and quinine. As you've likely noticed by now, these Clorox cleaning guys are everywhere in this image. This represents the fact that chloroquine should be considered your go-to medication to treat malaria of any type, unless it's a falciparum infection and it's serious. Or if the patient has a Vivax or a Valley infection, you need to add primaquine. And we've already discussed those exceptions to defaulting to chloroquine. But there's one last exception to this. After all, some strains of malaria are resistant to chloroquine. And you will know if you're dealing with a resistant strain of malaria if the patient doesn't get better. And in the case of resistance, you have a few drug options, all of which will be represented near this little circular cage. Now this cage was actually holding some iguanas in the health fair's patented pro-iguana wrestling match. These pro-iguanas represent proguanal, one of the medications you can use. As you can see, one of these Clorox cleaning guys has just been attacked by an iguana, indicating that proguanal can overcome chloroquine resistance. Next, notice how these escaped proguanas have actually started this guy, causing him to spill his ice cream cone on his toe. This represents a tovaquone, because he has a toe with a cone on it. And the fact that the symbols for proguanal and a tovaquone are so closely together in this image represents the fact that the two drugs should be administered together. Another option is mefloquine. To represent mefloquine, also pronounced mefloquine, we've added this meatloaf stand here at the health fair. As you can see, one of the Clorox cleaning guys was going to spray his cleanser on the meatloaf, which our seller was not okay with. You can even see that the meatloaf distributor has just knocked over that Clorox cleaner. And now that guy's falling backwards, gonna land on his bum. Meatloaf sounds like mefloquin. As a side note, I'm intentionally mispronouncing mefloquin when it should be mefloquin. But mefloquin makes it easier to remember meatloaf. Now one last note about these three medications the medications being mefloquine, atovaquine, and proguanal. Unless there's a compelling reason in a question stem to indicate otherwise, assume that malaria is not resistant to chloroquine. In other words, default to chloroquine unless you're persuaded to use one of these other drugs used for resistant strains. Now these rambunctious iguanas broke out of the ring for a reason. They were super hungry, so they started chasing after these mosquitoes that flew by. Now these mosquitoes represent the Anopheles mosquitoes, which can transmit the parasite if they bite you. Remember from our life cycle image that a mosquito will bite a person and inject sporozoites of malaria into the bloodstream. So again, iguanas chasing mosquitoes stands for malaria transmission through mosquitoes. Now once in the blood, the trophozoites of malaria can be seen within red blood cells. So taking a peripheral blood smear is the best way to diagnose a malarial infection. To help you remember this, we have shown another man startled by the iguana-related chaos. He's tripping into his own trough of red Gatorade. That poor Gatorade representative... Anyways, all that red Gatorade represents blood, and the fallen trough represents trophozoites which are found in the red blood cells. This is a micrograph showing a peripheral blood smear from a patient with a malarial infection, and you can see these red blood cells with trophozoites in them. These trophozoites create what's called a ring form, and you can see those ring cells pretty clearly. Now being able to recognize malaria trophozoites or ring forms is very high yield, so commit an image like this to memory. Now, as mentioned before, red blood cells will burst and release these merozoites into the bloodstream. And those merozoites trigger an immunologic response, giving the patient fever and chills. And as I told you before, different species will burst at different intervals. For example, Plasmodium vivax in Ovalle will burst every 48 hours, or two days. Plasmodium malariae will burst every 72 hours. And Plasmodium falciparum will burst irregularly. To help you remember that Vivax and Ovalley burst every 48 hours, or two days, we've combined them together, two species together for two days. Or you could think this Vivax and Ovalley guy has two dogs, one and two. Either way, you should be able to remember that Plasmodium Vivax and Ovalley cause red blood cell bursting every two days. Now let's talk about Plasmodium malariae, which causes the red blood cells to burst at three day intervals, or every 72 hours. To help you remember this, we have an extra fancy mole area over here. This fancy area is French theme, so this mole area sign reads mole area, a fancy way or French-like way of saying mole area. There's even a fancy French butler. Next notice in this fancy mole area, there's a luxurious couch shaped like the number three. So putting these ideas together, we have this mole area sign 
which represents Plasmodium malariae, and the fancy three-shaped couch represents bursting at three-day intervals, so patients with Plasmodium malariae will have a fever and chills every three days. Now for Plasmodium falciparum. As mentioned before, the bursting pattern for Plasmodium falciparum is irregular, so it's not very predictable. Because of this, we thought this false pair man with his irregular and explosive behavior should represent the irregular bursting pattern of Plasmodium falciparum. Now that we've covered the image, let's do a question to apply what you've learned. An 18-year-old otherwise healthy male complains of recurring episodes of chills and excessive sweating. Since his return to the United States from Papua New Guinea, he describes reliably experiencing a fever, chills, and diaphoresis every 48 hours. On physical exam, his abdomen is soft with mild organomegaly in the left upper quadrant. A peripheral blood smear is ordered. Chloroquine is administered. Based on the most likely plasmodium species, which of the following is most likely to occur following treatment? A. Eradication of all exourethrocytic plasmodium forms. B. Multiple bouts of severe hypoglycemia prior to recovery. C. Resolution followed by return of symptoms months later. Or D. Worsening fever and chills for several months. Now hopefully from the question stem, you notice that this patient has fevers, chills, and diaphoresis. And the blood smear shows a trophozoite ring form and the patient's left upper quadrant organomegaly is consistent with splenomegaly. So this presentation is consistent with a malaria infection. But the question asks us to make an assumption about the most likely plasmodium species. What clue do we have regarding which species it is? Well, we have the intervals of fever, chills, and diaphoresis, and those intervals are every 48 hours. And which species has an interval of every 48 hours, or every two days? That would be plasmodium vivax and ovale. With these species in mind, which of the following is most likely to happen after treatment with chloroquine? That would be C, resolution followed by a return of symptoms months later. This is referring to dormant hypnozoites in the liver finally releasing their merozoites into the bloodstream and starting the cycle again. Remember that plasmodium vivax and ovale, represented right here, cause the red blood cells to burst every two days. We remember this because we have two dogs here, one and two. Plus, we've grouped vivax and ovale together, one and two. So the bursting pattern for Plasmodium vivax and ovale happens every two days or every 48 hours. Lastly, we know that this dog right here getting hypnotized and having his mind be dormant for the time represents dormant hypnozoites in the liver. And this Clorox cleaning guy is getting barked down, indicating that chloroquine cannot kill dormant liver hypnozoites. You need to add primaquine to kill those, as represented by that promquine. Now choice A is wrong because exourethrocytic plasmodium forms is referring to forms in the liver, in other words, the hypnozoites, and these will not be eradicated by chloroquine. And choice B is wrong because we don't expect hypoglycemia in typical non-pregnant patients. Remember that it was that pregnant lady dropping all that bag of sugar to help you remember that pregnant patients are susceptible to severe hypoglycemia. Finally, choice D is wrong because treatment with chloroquine wouldn't worsen these symptoms. They may return, as we've discussed, but there's no reason to suspect that things will get worse with treatment. And that should be all you need to know about malaria.